In a previous video, I explained that methodological naturalism is just a description of what happens when you try to evaluate competing explanations on the basis of the regularities of experience. The supernatural is usually defined as just that which defies the regularities of experience. So the relative plausibility of explanations that feature the supernatural can't be evaluated. Today I want to focus in on one of the most common ways that competing explanations, especially in historiography, are evaluated, and that is analogical reasoning. Now, analogical reasoning involves the comparison of a source domain to a target domain. The source domain is usually the thing you know, and the target domain is the thing you are trying to learn something about. Um, so you are usually inferring some property of the source domain and you are predicating that to the target domain. Um, these come in three main features. We can break up divide analogical reasoning into figurative analogies, inductive analogies, and deductive analogies. Uh, figurative are mostly communicative. Um, inductive is what we're focusing on today. Inductive analogy itself can be divided up into two types, quantitative and qualitative analogical induction. Qualitative analogical induction is when on the basis of a degree of similarity, you can infer some other property. We're not going to be concerned with that today. I'm concerned, and most historical argumentation is concerned with quantitative analogical induction, where on the basis of a number of different shared properties, you infer one additional property about your target domain. So, in this case, we have a, ser a series of shared characteristics between the source domain and the target domain, A, B, C, and D. And on the basis of these shared characteristics, you are inferring a characteristic D. Now, quantitative analogical inference is incredibly common in ordinary historiography. One of the most basic exercises in writing ancient history is, of course, philology. How do you understand the meaning of a word? Well, what you do is you go find a word you're interested in. Say you're looking for the different meanings of the word hypothesis, which we get the word hypothesis from. What you do is you go look up other places where that word is used, hypothesis, and figure out how they're using it there. And if you want to argue that this use of hypothesis in this scolion I happen to be studying um, is this use and not this use, the use attested by um, Sextus Empiricus and not the use attested by Galen, what you do is you say, well, look at all these other similarities around it. Look, they're both used in medical contexts. Look, they're both used um, with this other word attached to it. You, you pile up a series of shared characteristics and you infer one property um, from the source domain for the target domain, right? But we use this in all sorts of different kinds of argumentation. If you are trying to figure out what it is plausible, most plausible that a person did at this time, um, you appeal to analogies. They often, histor historical explanations often boil down to quantitative or sometimes qualitative analogical inferences. But there's a problem with the model I've laid out here, and that is objects, things, whether we're talking about, you know, physical objects, people, events, or systems have an infinite number of characteristics. And that's because characteristics or properties are not things that exist out in the world. Properties are our description of things. And we can always describe things in finer and finer detail with greater and greater nuance. So how do we address this problem? Well, the first answer is a relational analogy. And a relational analogy is where you can specify or identify the causal mechanism or determining structure that correlates the specific properties you are using to justify your analogical inference. So what does that mean? That means you can say the thing we there is a thing that we can identify that makes these features relevant and these features not relevant for doing an analogical inference. Let's give a couple examples. Uh, say you are trying to you are trying to figure out who my brother is. There's a I'll give you a lineup of people and you're trying to figure out which one of them is my brother. Um, 
Genetics, genealogy, is a determining structure that you can use to pick out certain characteristics that would be relevant for figuring that out and certain characteristics that aren't. So the fact that one of them has a very, very similarly shaped nose to mine or has a similar voice to mine or is also six foot three, those are things that genetics tends to determine or tends to correlate between different things. And you can say, ah, those are relevant similarities for de determining which one of these people is Ian's brother. Uh, in contrast, whether or not they're wearing a sweater today, whether or not they have their hair done up in a certain way, whether or not they are whistling um, while I'm happening to be whistling, those are the sorts of things that are not determined by genetics and therefore are not um, cannot be used to justify an analogical inference. Um, another common one of these is convention. So to return to our philology example, uh, we can use literary convention to figure out, or not literary, we can use linguistic conventions, uh, communicative conventions, to figure out which features of a speech act are relevant for determining um, common usage. Uh, so for instance, um, the word hypothesis being used in medical contexts uh, is a relevant analogy, um, whereas them it being shouted in one context and um, spoken softly is probably not. Uh, that is, stick conventions, conventional uses of words, in order to get you to recognize what I am trying to communicate to you. Um, and because we operate that way, we know that conventions are a determining structure for different instances of a word, for different uses of a word. However, not all analogies, not all analogical inference is relational. Um, sometimes we can't readily or efficiently identify a causal mechanism or determining structure. And often this is because of complexity. So, um, but nevertheless, we find if you just go and look at the way scientists, historians, um, <clears throat> legal legal jurists, uh, medical professionals work, we nevertheless use non-relational analogies felicitously all the time. That is, they work for us. But why would that be? One example is convergent evolution. So um, John Kloppenberg, of all people, who just wrote a book on Christ associations, um, shows that, in, that paleontologists rely on structural analogies in skeletal systems uh, between animals that are not related. Um, you can look at how tailbones work in mammals to f learn things about how tailbones work in reptiles, despite the fact that they do not share a common ancestor with a tailbone. Um, another classic example of this is wings. We can infer things about the pterodactyl wing based on bats and birds, um, or if we were to discover a new animal that had no common ancestor with the modern bird, because that's a bit of a problem here, um, you can use these sorts of structural analogies to learn about things. Um, and in lots of cases, uh, we later find corroborating evidence for that. Similarly, we find very similar structures being built um, in different parts of the world without a common underlying convention. Uh, the, the pyramids and ziggurats of Egypt and of Mesopotamia and of South America do not share common ancestors. There's no common cultural convention that is um, that is informing all of these structures. So how is it that we have these structures um, being built and how is it that we can use analogy between these to talk about, you know, how it was in fact that these things were built? The answer is that carbon-based life forms operating under the constraints of gravity with the kinds of air resistance that we have, we'll develop the same structures, we'll do the same sorts of things. That is, there is a unspecified structure or mechanism, um, a unspecified causal context that produces regular correlates. And it is often not efficient or realistic to expect us to be able to fully spell out all of the things that go into um, different species developing similarly shaped wings in different contexts um, without a common ancestor. All of the properties that go into that, um, it is inefficient to demand an explanation for that in order to accept 
a analogical argument in order to accept that actually, yes, we probably, we can compare these things and learn something about our target domain from a source domain. And to do this with non-relational analogies, we depend on what we might call the analogical virtues or the criteria of non-relational analogies. Um, this is from an article by Alison Wheely, where she lists the analogical virtues as the number and extent of similarities between source and, uh, and subject, that is, between target and source, um, diversity of sources uh, cited in the premises in which known and inferred similarities co-occur as postulated for the subject, and finally, the expansiveness of conclusions relative to the premises. This is to say, how many source domains can you come up with that serve that share all the same features with the target domain in addition to the inferred characteristic that you're trying to get at and how many can you give that have all those same features that don't have that characteristic the more of the first and the fewer of the second the stronger the analogy will be moreover um if you can come up with things that have all those characteristics but no other shared characteristics and the inferred characteristic, that's going to strengthen your argument as well. And this is just a very technical way of describing the regularities of experience, the role regularities of experience play in evaluating competing explanations. You want to come up with lots of source domains that share all the same features with the target domain, but don't share any features not found in the target domain that all share the additional inferred characteristic. The more of those you can come up with, the more plausible will be your analogical inference. And this is a form of amplitude reasoning, so of course it will never be absolutely conclusive. Um, all learning is fallibilistic. They're all, it's always about competing explanations, and historical explanations are the same way. But you can see here why methodological naturalism is just how we work because there aren't regularities of experience to the supernatural by definition. So we cannot evaluate how more or less plausible they are. Um, and we shouldn't, wouldn't expect there to be regularities of experience, right? Because the thing that allows analogical reasoning to work are shared causal contexts determining structures. And if you believe that God is doing miracles on earth, God is not subject to those causal contexts he is not governed by the determining structures that allow our analogical reasoning to work.